Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the New Testament book of Philippians. The New Testament book of Philippians and Philippians in chapter number 1. The book of Philippians and chapter number 1. We're going through this wonderful book of the Bible and it's been encouraging how others have been saying how this has been a help to them and it's been a blessing to them and just seeing this wonderful relationship between the Apostle Paul and the church of Philippi as they had a desire to work in the gospel together and that we had saw already that they had fellowship in the gospel and that the Apostle Paul had explained that the things that had been done to him, putting him in prison, the persecution, had been done for the furtherance of the gospel. And then as we see in chapter 1 where we're at today, that the Apostle Paul is going to put this together with the church of Philippi and explain to them that they are going to be striving together for the faith of the gospel of Christ. And so if you don't mind, look with me in the book of Philippians chapter number 1. The book of Philippians chapter number 1, and notice with me starting at verse number 27. The book of Philippians chapter 1, and in verse number 27, the word of God says this, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you, or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast, in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which ye saw in me, and now here to be in me. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark on a very, very important phrase that we find in the book of Philippians chapter number 1. The book of Philippians chapter number 1, and notice towards the end, the very last phrase, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Striving together for the faith of of the gospel. And with the Lord's help, we want to hit this very important message and apply it to our local church of dealing with this idea of striving together for the faith of the gospel. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for the great privilege to be in your house once again. And we thank you that we could depend upon you, that we could watch you, that we could see what you would have for us and we can follow you. I'm asking that as we open up this passage, that you would illuminate our eyes, that you would open up the window and let us see what is being said here, and that you would also help us to properly apply this lesson to our church and to our lives, that we, together as the Riverview Baptist Church, can strive together for the faith of the gospel. Again, I desperately want and need you to fill me with your precious spirit. So the best I know how, I surrender myself to you with the expectation that you're going to do something wonderful and for eternity's sake because of your word. Thank you, Lord. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now the Apostle Paul was very aware that he was in the midst of a spiritual battle. He also knew that the job of accomplishing the Great Commission was too big for him alone. That only one person can do so much. That God has done 
what is called the miracle of multiplication, that instead of just having one person, God has made it so the work can be done with the miracle of multiplication, that as many people work together, the job can be done. So that requires the folks in this context of the, of the church of Philippi to strive for the together for the gospel with him so they can see this greater commission accomplished. There was a story told of a man who was working with his son and he was trying to teach him uh, <laughs> to get along with the squabbling brothers. I think there were seven squabbling brothers and every time they would turn around they were fighting with each other, they were snipping each other and they just were always against each other. So the father called the sons together and gave them a baboon, a babu cane and he said I want you to break this. And so the first son said, no problem. And he snapped it, no problem. The others all took theirs and they snapped theirs. And he says, what about this? And he gave them all baboon canes. And he said, why don't you and you put your canes together? And I want you to see. This time they were able to break it, but it was a lot more difficult. And so he gave them both canes again and said, how about this? Why don't you three put your canes together? And they could find that it was getting harder and harder. By the time all seven of them put their canes together, it was impossible to break. None of them can break it by themselves. And the father pulled him aside and said, listen, by yourself, you're vulnerable. You could be broken. But if you're all together, the outside forces can't break you. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is trying to get across to the church of Philippi. That if there's a togetherness, if there's a unity here, and the people are working together for that one goal, the outside forces cannot break that church apart. Unity is the goal. And remember, as we've learned in the book of Ephesians, how does a church get unified? How do they get it unified? When everybody's eyes are on the Lord. When everyone is looking at Him. You say, well, how does that tie with the unity of the gospel? Well, I'm glad you asked. Remember, the goal is Christ, so therefore, let's tie this together. Notice, if you don't mind, let's look at a couple of passages before we come back to the book of Philippians. Notice with me, if you don't mind, first of all, in the gospel record of Mark. The gospel record of Mark in chapter number 8. What we're doing now is we understand that unity comes from looking at Christ. So let's define our terms. What does that mean in regards of practicality to a local church, to a local congregation? If where eyes are going to come on Christ, if everyone's looking at Christ, how is that going to be received? How is that going to be carried out? Well, notice with me in the gospel record of Mark. Notice with me in chapter 8. The gospel record of Mark, chapter number 8. And notice with me, if you don't mind, starting at verse 34. The gospel record of Mark, chapter 8, verse 34. And when he, that's Jesus, had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So Jesus is now saying, if you're going to come after me, you have to follow me. What does that mean? Verse number 35, for whosoever will save his life will lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, notice this, and the gospels, the same shall save it. What is it tying in here together? Here we could see that Jesus Christ said, if you're going to follow me, you are also going to give your life to the gospel. Jesus has now tied those two things together. And so as a church, if we're going to strive together for the gospel, what we're saying is that we're putting our eyes on Christ and we're looking at him. That is going to be a unifying thing that Jesus is saying, for my sake and the gospel's sake. Notice, if you don't mind, as we see a little bit more, just defining our terms and seeing this clearly, notice within the gospel record of Luke chapter 19. The gospel record of Luke chapter 19. In the gospel record of Luke chapter 19, we see the purpose of Christ. What was Jesus' purpose? Why did he come? What was his goal? Notice with me in Luke chapter 19 and verse number 10. Luke 19 and verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save 
that which was lost. What was the purpose of Jesus Christ? To seek and to save that which was lost. May I say it this way? For the gospel. Why did Jesus come? For the gospel. And so once again we're seeing Christ's purpose is the gospel. And so therefore if we're going to follow after Christ. His purpose must become our purpose. What should our purpose be? If we're going to be looking at Christ and following after him. It's the gospel. This should be our unifying thing. This is what we should be put together for. This is what we're striving together for. To follow after Christ. Which also means to follow after the gospel. For the gospel's sake. May I show you just one more passage to illustrate this even further. Notice with me in the gospel record of Matthew chapter 4. The gospel record of Matthew chapter 4. A familiar passage to our folks and soul winning right now. Notice with me in the gospel record of Matthew chapter 4. And notice with me in verse number 18. The gospel record of Mark chapter 4 and verse 18. Notice what the Bible says. And Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brethren. Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea for they were fishers. And he Jesus saith unto them follow me and I will make you fishers of men. What we see here is the priority. The priority is to follow after Christ. As we follow after Christ, notice what happens. He makes us fishers of men. Notice, you don't make yourself a fisher of men. You follow after Christ. He makes you a fisher of men. So again, we're tying together for the... The unity of the church is to follow after Christ. How does that translate? That we're striving together for the face of the gospel. As we follow after Christ, Christ does a work in us to make us fishers of men. By the way, reverse that. If someone is not fishing for men, they are not following after Christ. That is clear. So we are striving together. How do you say that? Because if you're following after Christ like you should, He is making you a fisher of men. So therefore, if you are not a fisher of men, that means somewhere in the process you are not following after Christ. So what we're tying together is Jesus' sake is the gospel's sake. Following after Christ means to be fishing for men. Because he's going to be making us. So what we see is if the unifying part of the church is when we have our eyes on Christ. And when our eyes are on Christ, our purpose is the same. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now as we turn back to Philippians with that understanding, let's just dive into this a little bit more and have an understanding of what is being said here in the book of Philippians. The first thing I'd like to show you here is live like you were changed by the gospel. Live like you were changed by the gospel. Notice if you don't mind in verse number 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That word conversation carries the idea of the meaning of our behavior. So let your behavior, let the way that you live your life be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Again, what does that carry the idea? It means that if we believe the gospel is true and that the gospel has done something in us, we should live our life like we are saved. The gospel should change our life. And it should make us for who we truly are. Notice, we're writing to the church of Philippi. And the colony of Philippi was actually a Roman colony. Long before per official persecution began in Rome, the persecution had already begun in Philippi. In fact, the church of Philippi had already felt the brunt of persecution and harassment already beginning. In fact, if you're going to go back to the very beginning of this church, it began in persecution. Remember the Apostle Paul's preaching? And he got thrown into jail? And it, because he was in jail, uh, this church was started. This is part of what happened. Now, notice also in verse number 27. Only let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent... 
I may hear of your affairs. He says, I want you to live your life so that way I hear the testimony. The church of Philippi, they're following after Christ. That church over there, they're doing what they ought to be doing. That's what I want to hear from you. Notice as he goes on. That you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. He says, I want to hear the testimony of the church of Philippi. That you have one spirit. That you have one mind with one goal. Striving for the faith of the gospel. That's a powerful testimony. That should be the purpose of every Bible believing church. Is for the gospel. Everything that is done within a church. Should be answerable to the great commission. Now by the way. As the Apostle Paul is saying this, there's also, probably because he heard, there's a little bit of an undercurrent of some fragments. Now, he's already dealt with the church of, Cor of Corinth and dealt with their fragmentations. How does a church fragment? What happens? What breaks it apart? Where does the lack of unity come from? When people start to get the idea that they have their own ministry outside of the ministry that God's given to them. What is God given? The one purpose of the church is for the Great Commission. Now, what we do in the church is different aspects of that one ministry. So we could say it this way. There's not multiple ministries. There's one ministry and different aspects of that one ministry. And that everything is for the purpose of the gospel of Christ. Now, when people don't have their eyes on the Lord and get their eyes on other things, that's where the strife comes. Ha <sighs> ha you believe what pastor said and the gossip comes and their eyes are off Christ. They're on something else. Well, how come we don't do things this way like they do over here? Well, we need to keep our eyes on Christ. You see, Satan's always working on trying to break up the unity. And the way he does that is get their eyes off Christ on something else. I was dealing with someone the other day and they were saying, I'm at a place where there's only one church that's really good but it's got a couple things wrong with it. Should I join it? And the answer was, if you find a perfect church, don't join it because as soon as you join it, it's no longer perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect church. You don't want to know why? Because imperfect people are part of it. There's no such thing as a perfect pastor. If you find one, let me know. There's no such thing. The idea is, is that I'll be patient with you if you're patient with me. And I'll allow you to grow if you allow me to grow. We're going to work together as a bunch of sinners saved by grace who are imperfect and growing in the Lord. And we're just going to keep our eyes on him and grow together. This is the idea of unity. You can always find some fault with someone. And you look hard at me, you find something. You don't have to look that hard. In fact, I'll start telling you things you'd even know was wrong with me if you really want. But our eyes have to be on him, on him, on him. That's where the unity comes. And our unity is when we have the same goal, which is Christ. And what was Christ's goal? To seek and to save that which was lost. His goal must become our goal if we're going to make him our goal. And that's the purpose. That is our thing, is striving together for the purpose of the gospel. Striving together for the faith. Of the gospel. That's an important word for the faith of the gospel. That's we're setting it up because we believe this is what God has given us to do. We're stepping out by faith. We're stepping out. Someone was explaining the other day about church planting, and I was at a meeting and it was wonderful. And they were saying most churches wait to go start another church until finances and personnel and whatever else. And you want to know what when they're going to start a church? Never. If you're waiting for the provisions, it's not going to happen. But by faith, as you step out to obey God, then he provides. It's the obedience first and then the provision. This is why it's said we're striving together for the faith of the gospel. This is a faith work. It's not a work that, all right, once we get all the funds, then we'll start the work. No, it's we start the work expecting God to provide as we go out. That's looking to God. It is a faith work. Remember that. We'll talk about that in a little bit later. Notice a second thing that we have here is that striving for the gospel is evidence to those who have not been saved that the gospel is true. 
striving for the gospel is evidence to those who are not saved that the gospel is true. Notice with me in verse number 28. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries. Now notice this. This is awkward wording for the way that we use it. But it said in nothing. Absolutely nothing should terrify you by what your adversaries do. You know we are in a place of adversaries. There are people that hate Christ, that hate the church, that hate what the church is trying to get accomplished. They do not like the strife. We have a spiritual warfare. Without a doubt, we're in a spiritual warfare. And there are enemies. And a lost world is watching us. Now, they may not like it, but when we live the way that we ought to, striving for the gospel, it convicts them. By the way, that's why they respond poorly, because they are convicted. Think about the stories of the martyrs. These brave folks and the supernatural grace that was given to those who were killed by their faith. You take someone like John Huss, who was the morning star of the Reformation. He helped set up different things for the Bible, preaching in Bohemia. He was so hated that uh, later on, Mussolini, the dictator of Italy, wrote a book about how much he hated John Huss. Centuries later... But John Huss was a great preacher of Bohemia. And he was preaching the gospel. And he was arrested. And his wife was arrested. And they killed John Huss. Well, his wife, Lady Huss, was in jail. And she was mourning for her wife. And the day that she was to be executed, they came to grab her. And she was wearing a white dress. And they said, why are you wearing a white dress? You know you're going to die. And she goes, but I'm going to go meet my husband and I'm going to go meet my Jesus. Why shouldn't I celebrate and dress for the occasion? They begin to drag her to the place where she was going to be burned by the fire. And as they were dragging her out, she was telling everyone, He lives! Jesus lives! You can be saved too! For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And she kept preaching to the crowd. Finally, they stopped and said, Listen, you be quiet or we're going to rip out your tongue. And she kept preaching, kept telling people, kept proclaiming the gospel. Accept Christ, accept Christ. So they stopped the progression and they ripped out her tongue. With blood running down into her white gown. All she could do was point up. Still just doing the best to point to the message. As they put her up on (coughs) in chains. They looked at her. And as the fire began to burn around her. She had peace on her in the midst of the flames. So many stories of the martyr where God gives grace. Now we understand the lost can die bravely, bravely, but Christians who are being martyred die differently. The Christians who are martyred, so many tales of them, they're singing hymns as they're dying. They're forgiving people As they die. In fact the apostle Paul himself. When he gives his testimony. He always started with Stephen. And said it was because of that man. I got saved. To watch that man die. As I'm murdering him. He's looking up and said I forgive you. He said I never got over that. In fact that's why Paul went crazy. And started murdering Christians. Because that was such a conviction in him. So Paul is speaking from experience. That when Christians are living the way they ought. It's a testimony. But the lost world hates it. But it's a testimony. And the lost world notices a Christian. Who lives right. And has that grace of God. What a wonderful thing for this gospel. Notice as we go on, we see striving for the gospel will include suffering. Striving for the gospel will include suffering. There's something about suffering people don't like. We don't like to hurt. I don't know anybody who says, you know what? I feel like being hurt today. That's not something we don't volunteer for. But you have to understand that if you're going to live the way that you ought... It will include suffering. Now in America, we know very little of suffering. But God promised it. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse number 29. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Notice this. Paul said, guess what? Not only have you been saved, but you've also been called to suffer. 
You see, the Paul didn't see that suffering for Christ was something to be avoided. The Apostle Paul saw that suffering was a gift of Christ. Suffering is a gift of Christ. Now, how do we know this? Well, turn with me, if you don't mind, to the Gospel record of Matthew chapter 5. And let's look on the Sermon of the Mount. We're coming back to Philippians. But let's just see what Jesus had to say about this suffering. Matthew chapter 5. The Sermon of the Mount, notice with me in verse number 10. Matthew chapter 5 in verse number 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and sh shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. Notice this. For my sake. We've already tied in Jesus' sake. If we're following after Christ, then it's also going to include the gospel. If we're living the way that we should, we will suffer persecution. In America, that may just mean that someone looks sideways at you at work. Oh well. It may be that every once in a while we'll have someone slam on their door in the face. It may be that someone, like someone did to my little girl when she was about four years old, they took a track from her, then ripped it up and threw it back at her. Oh well, if that's the worst we've got in America, that's not bad. But God says, blessed are ye that suffer, that are persecuted. Notice as it goes on in verse number 12. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Why? Because you're being persecuted. Rejoice! That's not something we think about rejoicing with. But notice Jesus said rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now we don't think of persecution as an opportunity to rejoice. But Jesus said it is. If you're living the way that you should for Jesus sake and for the gospel's sake. Persecution is going to come. Now I admit I know very little. I don't know anything about persecution. But Paul did. In fact, can you imagine as he's writing this, the Philippian jailer who's in the church of Philippi is saying, Yelp. The Philippian jailer was saved because Paul was persecuted. And he's saying, yes, it was a wonderful thing for Paul to be persecuted. We understand that God knows what he's doing and that the world hates it. They're not going to cheer you on. By the way, backsliding Christians are not going to cheer you on. Christians who have never grown in the faith are not going to cheer you on. Christians who don't want to serve the God are not going to cheer you on. In fact, the greatest enemies you have are going to be other Christians if you try to serve God. Without a doubt, you're going to get criticized by other Christians. The lost world doesn't care what you do. Oh, there's other Christians because you're doing something they should be doing. They want to criticize you rather than obey. Understand that it's going to come and it's going to come from all sources and it's a promise. But God says rejoice in that promise. Celebrate that. That's why some people don't like to go soul winning and go off. They don't like the persecution. So they got to go find somewhere where they don't promote soul winning. They don't promote following after Christ. They'd rather be satisfied. I'm serving God some other way. But it doesn't line up with the gospel's sake. Notice as it goes on. Verse number uh, 30. Uh, verse 29 again. For unto you is given on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict in which ye saw in me, and now here to be in me. Now, was Paul's writing this letter, where is he at? He's in jail. Why? Because he was preaching the gospel. Again, he's saying, you've seen it in me. Why am I in jail? Because of the gospel. In fact, so many times in his prison epistles, he says, I'm in bonds in Christ. I'm not in bonds of Rome. I'm in bonds because this is where Christ put me at. And I'm rejoicing. Remember, the book of Philippians is the book of joy. In the midst of the persecution that's not only happening to the Philippian church, but to Paul who's currently in jail. For the gospel's sake. So how do we apply such things? Well, I would love to show you how we apply things for our own church. 
<coughs> we want to strive together in our church for the purpose of the gospel. So if you don't mind, I would love to welcome you to learn a little bit more about what our church is trying to do. I'd like for you to learn a little bit more about where we're going. The Bible says very clearly in the book of Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Now the Bible here is telling us two things. First of all, that the people need a vision. Why? So we could strive together. So we can move forward together. That we know where we're going, we're following after Christ. And that as we follow after Christ, it's also for the gospel's sake. And the Bible says, he that keepeth the law, he that obeying what God has said, happy is he. And so this is the purpose. We want to give a vision of where our church is going and what we're trying to do. Now the purpose of the Riverview Baptist Church is to accomplish the Great Commission in our generation in the Green Bay and surrounding areas. Now the completion of this goal includes actively training men and women for the ministry and starting churches. That's going to be our main purpose is we're moving to the place where we're starting churches. And the goal is God. We're looking at Him. So there are three aspects to accomplish the Great Commission in our region. We could break them up into three little words. Training, reaching, and planting. These are the three aspects that are used for our church to accomplish what God has given us to do. So let's talk about the steps to the goal. How are we going to accomplish this as God leads us? Well, phase one for the training, let's talk about training first. Phase one is discipleship training. We define discipleship as developing the habit of obedience to Jesus Christ. That as we provide accountability, we help younger Christians to be able to take a step forward and develop habits in our life. Everything we do in the Christian life is habits. We get in the habit of reading our Bible. We get in the habit of going to church. We get in the habit of praying. We get in the habit of witnessing. And so when it, our discipleship helps provide accountability to develop these habits for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now phase two is the Green Bay School of the Bible. We call it Green Bay because it's the closest biggest city here. The Green Bay School of the Bible. And here in the Green Bay School of the Bible, we now equip people who are serving the Lord. We're trying to give them a better understanding and give them a biblical worldview. This is the second phase of our training people. And then the third phase would actually be a Bible institute through the Riverview Baptist Church. With where we are purposely training men and women for the ministry. This is this training aspect. We also have the reaching aspect. We want to have a continued organized soul winning. Our purpose is to organize our efforts to reach our area for the Lord. The eventual goal is to knock on every door in Green Bay once a year. Seymour, that's already accomplished. We can knock on every door in Seymour once a year already. We're moving to the goal to also knock on every door in Green Bay. By the way, when we finish that, we want to knock on every door in Seymour, Green Bay, and Appleton once a year. And we want to continue going on. And we have a plan of doing this. We will continue to bring more people along and train them how to reach people so we can multiply our efforts. Only one person could do so much. But if we have the miracle of multiplication, the job can be done. Now as time goes on, we want groups of our folks to adopt an area to invest and make their mission field. So I am the missionary to Seymour. I'm the missionary to Ashwabanon. I'm the missionary to East De Pere. I'm the missionary to Alloway, to Bellevue. And they make it their place where they're praying in it and they're investing in it. So what do these people do as they take ownership? They're going to take a responsibility to pray for the area. To pray that people would get saved. To pray that people would follow after Christ. They're going to take the responsibility to soul win in the area. This is the area that I'm investing my soul winning efforts. They're going to start discipling people from that area. And then as we have the opportunity, we want to start Bible studies in that area. So in each of those different areas, we want a Bible study going. We want people being reached with the gospel of Christ. Now, as those areas are adopted and we're actively training men and women, remember we talked about the training, we're going to start Thursday night Bible studies. This will allow some young men to begin to lead in those areas and continue their training becoming pastors and maybe missionaries one day. 
Other people that we've trained are going to assist them. So people have gone through the evening school. Some people have got some Bible Institute training. They're going to assist them using the skills that they have been taught to reach and disciple others, teach classes, and be a help. Think about this. Instead of just sending a husband and wife family to an area, what if we sent a team of people to go start a church? Don't you think that church would function a lot better starting off the ground if we had several people there instead of just two people trying to struggle? The Bible shows us in, in the Apostle Paul's life, he traveled with a missionary team. And sometimes there was upwards to maybe 20 people when he would travel to a different place to start a church. No wonder he could get a church up and running in about a year, two years time. Because it wasn't just two people struggling together. We would love to have that where we're training people and starting churches in all of the areas. Eventually these Bible studies will become self-sustaining churches. Now these churches will be started with the same vision that we have. And the expectation they're going to continue with that same vision. What are those vision? To train people, to reach them the gospel, to disciple them. And to start more churches. Churches will birth other churches in all of the Green Bay area, all of the Fox Valley, and beyond. We're going to spread out. This is the goal. So think about this. If we just, we already have a church here in Seymour. What if we spread our efforts and saw something started? Nashwabadon, Oneida, the Green Bay West area, De Pere, hit Howard, even hit uh, Samaco. Then on the other side of the river, hit Alloway, Bellevue. And then hit downtown Green Bay as well as Green Bay East. And hitting our efforts. Seeing people saved in each of these areas. Have Bible studies in each of these areas. And even see churches planted in each of these areas. By the way, from this little church, God can do it. Amen. He can absolutely do it. And by the way, I believe it's God's will for to do it. Because we're following after him. And God wants to multiply our efforts. Then after we reach that area, we can hit all of Brown County and Outagamie County and hitting all of those and then spread to all of Northeast Wisconsin. Hit them all and start churches everywhere. Now someone may throw in an objection. They may say, wait a second. If we started all those churches, won't we have too many churches in our region? Well, let's think about this numerically. At the 2019 census, Green Bay had 104,000 people. The Green Bay metropolitan area, do you know that there's actually official metropolitan area? It says that it has 306,000 people. You take out a Gamey County and it has 187,000 people. Well, what if we started, theoretically, 104 churches in Green Bay? 306 churches in the Green Bay metropolitan area and 186 churches in Outagamie. You know what that would mean? There would be one church per thousand. Isn't that plenty for a church to have? So even if we started 100, 300 churches, there's still enough lost people to go around. We're, we're not going to oversaturate it. In fact, if we understand, not all 1,000 people will go to those churches numerically, but each church can easily make sure the gospel was presented to every person in that region, which is the whole goal of the thing anyways, to give every person the chance to receive Christ. Now at this stage, we're only hoping to start a church in each village, town, and city. Now if a city or town has more than one, great! But clearly, without a doubt, Green Bay, everything on this side of Outagamie County, Appleton, all of them need more churches, need Bible-believing churches that are reaching people with the gospel. So where are we at? Well, let's try to take an evaluation of what we're at and what steps are we taking now. Currently, we're working on getting people through discipleship and encouraging them to start discipling others. That's why we're discipling you, by the way, for those of you who are in discipleship. We have the expectation that one day you're going to be teaching someone else. Now, the purpose of this is so that way pastor doesn't, and Miss Leah don't have to disciple everyone. We want it to multiply where this is being taken care of as many people are doing the job. And then we also have the Green Bay School of the Bible. As this is continuing, my desire is to take people who've went through the class and teach them how to teach the class so I can step out of the way and someone's taking that as their goal and I can begin to work on 
other things of starting and getting people involved. By the way, what does this mean? Everyone has a role to play. Everyone has a part to play. Now, currently, present tense, we're also praying an area to start a Thursday night Bible study. This will be the next step in seeing another church start it. Someone may say, well, wait a second. Should we wait till the finances? Remember what we said? We step forward and God will do the supplying. We just want to see where God leads us and expect God to do what he's going to supply. Now, as an assurance, we're not going to abandon the Seymour location. By the time a church is prepared in the next area, we're trusting the Lord to already allow us to have a young man that we've trained to be able to take the work. So we're going to have, instead of a church that's splitting, we're going to have two churches that are moving forward and still not abandoning this Seymour area because this is important. It's where we're having a lot of harvest at. So what can you do to help us move forward? Well, first of all, be faithful to the services. We have to have people who are faithful, who've made it their determination that I am going to put my life and influence in helping this local church go. That includes being present, being here. People need to be here live. Also to join us for organized soul winning as we organize our effort to reach the areas that God has placed us steward over. You could be and participate in our organized soul winning. Also continue through discipleship, understanding this is important of helping people develop the habit that if you're in discipleship, knowing that please complete it and we want to use you to teach someone else. Those who have completed discipleship, we're praying that God would give you someone to teach as we organize our efforts and continue to go forward. Also continue to join us for the Green Bay School of the Bible. Remember, this is the second phase of teaching. We want to teach you more than what could be taught from the pulpit here. We want to give you some specialized training to help you have a better understanding of your Bible and applying it as we move forward together. And then pray for wisdom as we're looking for our next Bible study location. We're praying, where would God have us? Where can we get a storefront? I tell you that as pastor drives around town, I see an empty storefront and I'm looking. There's a Sears that's closed over a military. I pray for that all the time. I'm willing to offer them a dollar and they don't seem to want it. But you never know what God will do. Storefronts everywhere that are available. Wouldn't it be nice to see God provide? And God can. We just need to pray and ask God to open up a door. Now remember in the book of Philippians where we're at, Philippians 1.27. Only let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else you be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit. With one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. And with that, this is what the vision of our church is. And we would love for you to be a great part of what God has given this local church to do. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you could give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.